morning. I see some new faces and some familiar faces. Um, we're doing this again in April and May, and if you've attended all of them in May, you're going to get a quiz. <laughs> see what you've attained. <laughs> Hopefully through this series, um, you've learned a lot more about school finance and can pass a quiz. Um, but no, there won't be a quiz. Um, we are still planning April and May, so after today, if you have suggestions on something you would like to hear again, maybe you want to go all the way back to the beginning, please let me know so that we can tailor the information for what best suits your needs. So with that, today we're going to talk about recapture. Um, so hopefully after today, you have a better understanding of the system of recapture in Texas. We're going to look at the ways that the state provides for school districts to reduce what is called excess local revenues. And then what I really want to hone in on and point out is just because your property tax bill increases, that doesn't mean that the school district has extra money. Because our revenues are not determined by our tax collections. So if you understand these three, three things when you leave today, then it's a success. So what is recapture? So I thought it would be good just to go to the dictionary. What is the definition of recapture? What are we talking about here? So according to Webster, it's the act of retaking. Um, and the last definition is probably the most appropriate here. A government seizure, sounds intense, <laughs> of under law, so this is law, of earnings or profits beyond a fixed amount. And that's what we're talking about, the state's state decides how much money we're entitled to keep and anything above and beyond that, those extra profits go back to the state. So I want to play for you a little video and then we're going to break this down into how it really applies to Dripping Springs ISD. So, the size of the last is based on the amount of money that the state of Texas says each school district should have. School districts serving more students have a bigger class. School districts serving fewer students may have a smaller glass. Students and district characteristics can also increase the size of the glass, and so does the district's tax effort. Local property tax revenue is like water flowing in. Some districts cannot fill their glass with local tax revenue, so the state provides the revenue to fill it up. Sometimes the water from local tax revenue spills over. This is known as recapture. The state comes in and soaks up all the water outside the glass. So how do you reduce recapture and stop so much water from overflowing? Well, you could pour less water, but that would mean a decline in property values, and that's not good for the economy. Reducing the tax rate can also mean less water flowing into the glass if the state reduces the tax rate. But if the local school district reduces the tax rate, that can shrink the glass, which means just as much water outside the glass subject to recapture, but less water in the glass to educate students. Or there is another way. Let's make a bigger glass. Let's make sure every school district's glass is full. If it's not filled with local property taxes, then the state should pour in the rest of the water. What we don't need is the water from our local property taxes spilling out of the glass and making a mess. Okay, so if you were with us in January, I used sand. You got a flat roof, like. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't want to spend tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you don't want to know about your roof. <laughs> okay, so Texas recapture. So this used to be known as Chapter 41. For us that grew up with Chapter 41, it's really hard to change the terminology. It's also been called Robin Hood because it was stealing from the rich districts to give to the poor. It's not exactly working that way anymore. It used to be measured by excess wealth. So if you had more wealth per student, then you were considered recapture. House Bill 3 in 2019 really changed all of this, moved it to Chapter 49, and it became local revenue in excess of entitlement. So it's no longer a measurement of wealth per student, but it's a measurement of how much excess revenue do you have above your entitlement. And so your entitlement is your tier one local share, here's the Texas Education Code, and will it exceed, will your local share exceed your district's entitlement? And so recapture is the process where certain districts send some of their tax collections back to the state. 
The best analogy I ever heard about this was many years ago, when you think about the district next door to us, so let's say Wimberley is very close. Let's say Wimberley got the Tesla plant instead of Del Valley. Wimberley is going to have additional tax collections now because of that massive property value. If there weren't recapture, then Wimberley could say, oh my gosh, we'll pay teachers $100,000 a year. Everyone will want to come here. We'll buy all new classroom materials, etc. And so us, being right next door, would not be able to compete with that. And so what recapture tries to do is level the playing field so that one district that gets a big increase in property value doesn't benefit unfairly from other districts across the state. So as I said, the intent is to have roughly the same amount of money per student. What's happened though is you're going to see recapture payments have grown so large that now the state is using that to fund other obligations in their budget. So it's no longer where the state says, okay, we have this recapture money, we're going to redistribute, redistribute that to other school districts. And so we're going to take that, we no longer have to provide what we are going to provide for public education. So we're going to use those dollars set aside for education for other things. So once TEA determines that a school district is going to have more revenue than it's entitled to, they provide you five ways to get rid of that extra revenue. So one is you can consolidate with another district. And this is literally going to a neighboring district and saying, hey, Johnson City, Wimberley, let's consolidate so that I'm giving you some of my property revenues and we're not going to be considered excess revenue. You can detach, so I could give up part of my value to another school district. That gets really messy. The one that most districts, and I would say 99.99%, is purchase of attendance credit. So that's what it's called by law, but it's really us just saying, here's our excess local revenue, remitting a payment to the state to get rid of that. It's called purchase attendance credits in that we're buying student credits to reduce our local revenues. Another way is to educate non-resident students. This requires voter approval and then an agreement with another district to send the money directly to them. The nuances with this is we never really know what our final revenue is until about two years after our year is closed. So if I partnered with a district in West Texas, sent them money, and then two years later, oh, I was supposed to have some of that back, now I've got to go collect the money from that other district. Maybe they don't have the funds, so that one gets really messy, so that's why no one is doing that one. And then fifth, there is tax-based consolidation. Again, this requires voter approval. And then the creation of a consolidated taxing district. Um, both of those have to agree to the same exemptions, the same tax rate. So all of these get you to the same result, but all of them are way more complicated than option three. And when I checked with some of the people across the state, no one has ever seen number five be done. Um, detachment, this one almost happened, happened in Houston ISD several years ago when they had to have an election in order to do number three. And they said, we'll play chicken with the state. And they told the voters, vote no. The voters voted no. And so now TEA had to go in and say, well, I've got to reduce your wealth. So they were going to take the Galleria and give it to another school district. So you can't physically pick that up, right? But that taxing base went to another district. And Houston said, oh, okay, you're serious, we'll do another election, and they got it passed. So TEA will detach your property to reduce your excess revenues if you don't do it on your own. So these are the ways that we have to reduce our excess revenue. Number three is purchase of tenants credits, and that's what virtually every recapture district does. So this is a picture of recapture across the state. So back in the beginning, it was very, very small. We didn't hit the million dollar mark until 20, 2004. 
And then you can see, anyone know why we see this drastic increase in 2023? So, rooftops. Property values. So this is across the state. We're estimated this year to hit nearly $5 billion in recapture payments. And that is statewide, and that is totally a function of property values. School districts have lowered their tax rate across the state, and I'll show you what that looks like towards the end. This is simply because of property values. So in 2019, when House Bill 3 came along, you see a small dip. House Bill 3 was supposed to address recapture. It did for a little while, but um, the system was out of whack again. For our school district, this year, we're estimated to exceed 23 million. And I peeked into Joseph's spreadsheet this morning. I think now we're at 24 million for this year. Um, so you can see we were barely in recapture here. We went back in 1617. This is when we went to the voters um, for the TRV, and then recapture has increased. It went back down with House Bill 3. And then what's happening across the state is definitely happening in our district. So to understand recapture, we've got to step back and we've really got to talk about the tax rate and tax collections because that's what drives recapture. So let's go back to understanding the tax rate for the school <coughs> district. So recapture happens when your local tax collections exceed the amount necessary to fill the glass. So remember in the video, there's a glass. And how you fill that glass, the size of that glass depends on your students and some formulas. So the size of your glass is not determined by your property taxes, it's determined by your students. Then the level of tax collections measured is, that's measured before any state aid is received. So the state wants to know, based on the size of your glass, how much of that can you fill locally before we even get involved. Recapture only applies to the maintenance and operation tax rate, so this is very important. It's only one side of the tax rate that recapture applies to. And so here are those two buckets of tax collections. So remember on the green side, this is maintenance and operations. These tax dollars are what we use to fund the daily operations. This is where all salaries across the district are paid, all the supplies, everything it takes to run the district. These are the dollars that are subject to recapture. The other side of the tax rate is what we dedicate to pay off bonds that have been approved by the voters in the district. These dollars are not subject to recapture. So, like I just said, the total tax rate is split. So you have M&O and INS, and then to make things really fun, on the M&O side, it's split into three different categories. So not only do you have a breakdown of the total tax rate, within those taxing areas, you've got an additional breakdown of the MCR, which according to Tony is the minimum, but the law says it's the maximum compressed rate, your golden pennies and your copper pennies. And we're going to look at those in more detail. What happened in House Bill 3, before House Bill 3, setting the school district tax rate was really easy. Most districts tax taxed at the max, which at one point was $1.50, then it was lowered to $1.04, and then House Bill 3 came into effect, and now it changes every year. So it's really fun developing a budget when you don't really know what your tax rate is going to be. You don't know what to tell your school board as far as this is what the tax rate looks like when we adopt our budget. After the maximum compressed rate, and TEA certifies that, and that's based on what the state thinks property values are going to do statewide, and then how you compare to that state estimate, then the school board can adopt up to five golden pennies on top of that MCR. Voters can authorize three additional golden pennies, and only voters can authorize copper pennies up to nine. Before House Bill 3, only voters could approve golden and copper pennies. So House Bill 3 did give the school board the autonomy to get up to five through a series of processes. 
The INS rate, however, that is set by the school board and that is looked at each year at a rate that's necessary to pay voter approved debt and the max on that is 50 cents. So here's a visual of the total tax rate. So on the m and side, first you have tier one. This is level one of recapture. So this is that maximum compressed tax rate. The state tells us what that can be. Then you have these enrichment pennies. This is called tier two, and this is level two of recapture. The golden pennies are called golden because there is no recapture on those. There's a guaranteed yield. So if your tax rate and your tax values don't generate that guaranteed yield, the state will kick in money to make sure you earn that amount. So that's why these are golden. You can earn state aid and there's no recapture. So there's no lid on that glass. That glass can grow. The copper pennies, they are subject to recapture. There's a smaller guarantee yield on those. You can earn state aid, but if your effort, like your tax rate and your tax values exceed that guarantee yield, you will pay recapture. And then the other portion to get the total tax rate is the INS. And again, there's no recapture on those pennies. So we've talked about the tax rate. What determines when recapture is going to come into play? So as I said, the funding formulas are going to determine how much revenue the district gets in tier one. And so that is going to be based on our student counts, what kind of students we have, and characteristics about our district. That becomes the tier one entitlement. That's the size of the glass that we're trying to fill. We then compare our taxes at that tier one rate against that tier one entitlement, and we'll look at how that works out. So the tier one taxes are that MCR times our property values. The MCR is set by state formulas, again, anticipated property growth across the state and certified by TEA. TEA certifies that to us at the 1st of August. So in April, we get an estimate from our appraisal district of what our values will be. That's an estimate. We build our budget on that. In July, we get the certified values. And then right after that, we submit those to TEA, and TEA certifies our MCR. Property values, again, are set by the local appraisal district. And this is very important. They're reviewed by the state comptroller. So throughout the system, there are checks and balances. So the comptroller comes in every other year and reviews appraisal districts to make sure they're appraising property at a level that is, an appro is appropriate. So what happens is the comptroller has sales data that the local appraisal district may not have access to. And so what the comptroller is doing is making sure that the state is not picking up more of its share than it should. So that's a whole other session. In that short video, uh, you know, the example of the glass uh, and the example where the glass was overfilled by, by incoming revenue, and it suggested that if, if we reduce, if we made an effort to reduce that in incoming, that excess incoming revenue, it would shrink the size of the glass itself. So could you explain why? Yes. The reason is we all get, every school district gets $6,160 per student. That's assuming you tax at that MCR. This is reduced if you don't tax at that MCR. So if this is reduced, this, is, this determines the size of your glass. You're going to take this number times your total students in attendance, not in enrollment. And so if we have 10,000 students times 6,160, you can do the math on that. Then we look at our students. So if they are compensatory ed, meaning they're at risk of failing or dropping out of school, we get an additional weight on those so they earn additional money. Our special education students get additional dollars. And then you go through career tech, early education. These are all of our special weights. Bilingual, we get a transportation allotment. We get an allotment for being fast growth, but you'll notice these with an asterisk, fast growth, gifted and talented, school safety, new instructional facilities allotment. 
These are capped, meaning that the state says, I'm going to put X amount of dollars towards this program, but then at the end of the day, if all of the school districts earn more than that, we're going to prorate because we didn't give enough money. So my beef is, this past year, the state saved so much because of property value growth, they have excess, they have budget savings, plus they have recapture dollars, they could fully restore these allotments. So there's also a formula transition allotment that certain school districts get to make sure that they were not hurt by this change in law. Joseph, is it fast growth or formula transition? We just found out last month we're losing a million dollars because of the probation. Formula transition? Formula transition. So if we lower this, Tony, the size of our glass gets smaller, and so our tax collections don't change, so our recapture goes up. So uh, I'm assuming in our district we, we do employ both copper and gold pennies? Yes. So if the MCR it, itself is, is causing this overflow, what, why do we even have, why have we found additional golden any pennies on top of that. I'll show all. you why, because it gives us additional revenue. Well, but the whole problem is the excess revenue that is now being swollen for us. They're it's the excess on this tier one. This tier one is based on all of these. And if we don't tax at the MCR, this amount is reduced. So forget about the golden and copper right now. Tier one entitlement, there are mechanisms put in place so districts don't force the state to pay more than their share. So if, if, if we tax below the MCR, uh, that reduces the size of the glass. If we don't use any of the pennies, does that reduce the size of the glass? No. Those are on top of the glass. Those are enrichment. I'm still not understanding why, why would we employ any penny, extraneous pennies at all? What We've already there? got an excess. Let's, let's go through it all and maybe it'll clear it up. So this is the tier one. That's our total revenues. All of these allotments, this basic allotment. Now this is what we're hoping the legislature adjust because when you adjust it for inflation, this was set in 2019, it hasn't been changed. When you adjust it for inflation, it's about 5,700. So if they adjust this just for inflation, this needs to be between 6,700 and 6,900. I don't have a lot of hope that they're going to increase it that much, but we'll see. <clears throat> so after you figure out this, after you figure out this allotment right here, based on these formulas, the question becomes, who's going to pay for it? So first, we get a little bit of available school fund. That fills part of the glass. Then we look at the local share. What can local taxes cover? before we even get to the state saying we'll help pay for education. And then if our local share doesn't fill the glass, the state <coughs> will help fund that. So let's look at tier one, just level one recapture. So if this is the size of our glass, and remember this is based on our students and our district characteristics, this is the revenue that we earn. Nowhere in this calculation do property taxes come into a play yet. This is based on our students. So if that's our glass, if this is our tier one entitlement, then we say, how are we going to fund it? So then we compare the size of this glass to our tax collections. The tax collections are the MCR times the taxable property values. If the entitlement is larger than the tax collections, then we're going to get some state aid to fill the glass. So this is what that looks like. So on the left, this is measuring the size of the glass. Here's the available school fund money. So even recapture districts get this. Then we pour the glass full of our tax collections on the MCR. If this glass goes to here and our tax collections go here, what happens? Eight, eight, right? The other scenario, here's our same tier one entitlement. Here's our tax collections. So in this scenario, they perfectly balance. They're equal. 
then you don't need state A because your glass is full, perfect. No recapture, no state A. I don't know if there's any districts that hit this. That would be very rare. So again, if that's our entitlement, you've got your available school fund, here's your tax collections, you're done, right? Is there any room? Nothing spills over, but there's no room for state aid. The third scenario, you're saying to your one entitlement, compare to your tax collections, now my tax collections are more than my entitlement. Now what happens, there's no room for state aid, right? But now we're going to pay recapture because water is going to spill over this tier one entitlement. So what that looks like, here's my entitlement on the left, that's the size of it. Here are my tax collections. What's happening with tax collections? They're over the entitlement, right? So that excess, that over the entitlement amount becomes recaptured. So let's talk about your question, Tony. If I lower this, if I lower my tax collections, by not taxing at that MCR, this left side is going to go down. This is going to go down too, but I'm still going to have excess. But I wasn't asking about reducing the MCR, I was asking about reducing the pennies or not even having excess pennies. Okay, so let's go to the excess pennies. So that's the tier one. So some common misconceptions, praise values and tax collections determine our operating budget. Did we see that? What determines our operating budget, the revenues? This is the test. Students. <laughs> Remember, it's the tier one entitlement. It's this picture right here. That is our revenues. Tax collections aren't here. They aren't in these formulas. They're about how do you fund this. Another misconception, lowering the tax rate will lower recapture. We must at tier one, we must tax at the MCR, or here it is, the commissioner shall, shall reduce state aid or just the limit on local revenues if you're not in compliance with this section. So the state wants to make sure you're not gaming the system and saying, oh, well, we'll just lower our tax rate, we'll make the state pay more of this. They're, they're on to us. Just lower the tax rate so you don't pay recapture. So this is where you could do this. This is the golden and copper pennies were in enrichment. So we're going to look at the golden and copper. There's no recapture on golden pennies. So this is money. And in some years, it's also money from the state. So you're leaving money on the table if you don't have those golden pennies. Wait, are you, some of the golden pennies could be funded by the state? Yes. Last year gold, they were. I thought, I thought the pennies were pennies that were added to our rate. Remember, these pennies are guaranteed to generate a certain dollar amount. If you don't generate that dollar amount on your own, the state will help you get there. So you'll see that happen last year. We could reduce the golden and the copper pennies in full transparency, and that means we're going to have less money for programs and we're going to have budget cuts. So I'll show you what those equate to. And when you start cutting, you don't get to pick and choose. You can't say, oh, well, I'm going to reduce the golden. It's last in, so you're going to reduce all your copper first. Then you would reduce your golden, and then you would reduce your MCR. You don't get to just pick where you cut. So this is those golden and copper pennies. This is tier two, level two part of recapture. So this, these are the pennies we're talking about. So over here, this tier one, that was all the entitlement. There's no way to reduce, to get out of recapture over here. That's just how the system works. Here, you do have some flexibility. So in 2016, we went to the voters and we got approval for all the golden pennies we could get and all the copper pennies. And we did that by lowering the INS rate and increasing the m and rate for these golden and copper pennies. So these are referred to as enrichment. So these are totally up to the discretion of the school district, and this is to enhance your program. This is to get additional dollars so that you're not just providing a standard program. Would we be able to do the things we're doing in theater and band and small engine repair without these dollars? 
Probably not. It would just be a pure basic education program. So this is to supplement the basic funding under Tier 1. They, most of them do have to be approved by the voters, and then five gold in, the board can set. Now here, we're talking about WADA. This is our weighted ADA. So again, this is kids in attendance, the weighted students, so our WADA is always greater than our ADA. So you get to apply these pennies against WADA, and then it looks at how many of these pennies do you have, and then there's a guaranteed amount. So every penny, every golden penny, is supposed to generate the same dollar amount no matter if you're in Houston or Amarillo or here in Austin. So across the state, there's a guaranteed amount for these pennies. And what that is, is on the golden side, every penny is supposed to generate $98.56 per water. So you take your water, times 98.56, times the number of pennies. Again, the board can, have, can authorize five. The voters have to approve the next three. That happened here in 2016. There's no recapture. That's why they're golden. They're worth, they're worth more, and there's no recapture. The copper pennies, they're not worth so much. They're only 49.28 a penny times WADA. Again, the voters are required to approve up to nine. Now we had nine. Now we only have 5.83. And that's because they have compressed since House Bill 3. We're expecting these to compress again in this session, and what they do is they increase the yield so fewer pennies generate more. So the revenue doesn't change, but the pennies go down. So if the state increases this yield and these compress, that equates to tax relief. So I might be able to generate the same dollars on two of these pennies versus the five that we have now. So that's what we're waiting to see what the legislature does. These are subject to recapture. That's why they're copper and they're not worth as much. So let's look what happened to Dripping Springs. So these are our actual numbers from last year. We had property value growth of 17%. Weighted average, so our WADA was 8,941. Our guaranteed yield is 98.56. We had eight pennies. So you take 98.56 times the WADA times eight pennies, we are guaranteed to earn $7,050,000 on those eight pennies. What happened last year when we applied these eight pennies to our values, we only generated six million. So guess what? The state kicked in another million. So we would have left a million dollars of state aid on the table we hadn't had those pennies. So you understand how the guaranteed yield works? It's you're guaranteed to generate a dollar amount per penny. So let me understand the golden and copper pennies, this is just guaranteed funds to the budget. Is that correct? To the school district. And then we, the district, gets to decide where those funds are allocated, or we specifically have to allocate these golden and copper pennies to certain No, it just areas. goes into our revenue the general. bucket. Okay. We don't say, oh, this golden penny is going here or okay. it's just revenue to the total budget. So, so like most of the pennies are just letting us know how much text you can keep, but this one actually has a component that lets you get a little bit of state aid even if you have overflowed or places. Right. School districts that don't look at these golden pennies to see, especially poor districts, they might be leaving a lot of money on the table by not looking at what would so that's why you see districts go out for two or three of those golden pennies because they might be generating additional state aid. It could be a 50-50 split. It depends on your values. When we look at our copper pennies, again, this is last year, 21-22. Remember, they're guaranteed yield 49. We have 5.83. So the yield times the WADA times the number of pennies we have we're guaranteed to earn 2.6 million on these pennies. Our values said we earned 4.3, so we didn't get to keep this 1.8. So we did pay 1.8 million in recapture on these copper pennies last year. So this is where someone might say, well, it's not worth the copper pennies. Get rid of them. 
but we're getting 2.6 million, and so what would we have to cut to give up that 2.6 million? And if the legislature increases this yield and compresses these pennies, I'm potentially getting 2.6 on fewer pennies. Does that make sense? So let's look at 22-23, current year. Now this year, because our values went up so much, now on the golden, we're guaranteed 7.5 million. And why did we get more than we got last year? And that's because our water went up. The yield stayed the same, the pennies stayed the same, but our water went up. So now this year, we're entitled to 7.5 million on the golden. We're generating 7542. Guess what? We get to keep that. We don't have to pay anything back. The state says, well, I don't have to help you get there. You got even more, but you get to keep it. Again, why the golden? On the copper side, now they're worth almost 2.7, but we're yielding more because values went up, so our recapture went up by a million. So we're not allocating these revenues to specific programs, but this is what we're netting equates to in our budget. So on the tier one, remember this MCR, our entitlement, we have gross tax collections of over 76 million. We're entitled to 55, so we had to pay, this is where part of that 23 million is coming in. Part of it is tier one. So when we look at our budget, classroom teachers and supplies, 48 million. Facilities and maintenance and utilities, 8 million. So this is not our entire budget. I'm just trying to break down how it equates. So if we decided it's not worth paying recapture on these copper pennies, get rid of this $2.6 million that the school district is retaining from that. Well, our fine arts and our athletic programs across the district, their budget is $2.6 million. So I'm not saying that's where we would cut, but that's the budget equivalent. So that's why, in my mind, it's worth keeping those pennies. Yes, we do pay some recapture on them. And I want to see what the legislature does, because if I'm going to get $2.6 million on three pennies, then it's going to be worth keeping them. All right, so an overview of our total tax rate. The green is the MCR, so for us. This is the max and the floor. So when the state sets these maximum compressed rates, there's also a floor. You can't drop below that. And, if, and the reason is if you drop below that, then the state's paying more, right? So there's a level where you can't go below, and for us, we can't go above. Then we layer on the golden and the copper pennies. Again, over here, you can have nine. And then on the INS, we're at 35, you can have 50. So the allowable rate for us is $1.47. We're at $1.29. <coughs> so I fully expect this 8046. I think I heard this week there's a bill to drop it another 15 cents. That would be huge. That also means the state is going to start contributing more to education. So Remember, every time they lower that, they're picking up more of the bill. So they have to balance how much money do we have, is this sustainable? Because my fear is if they drop too much, then in three years they don't have the money, and now they're not making us whole again. So when I talked about across the state what is happening with property values and compression of the tax rate, this is 22-23 over here, this is 21-22. And so the colors are showing that 8046 in purple over here, 701 districts out of 1,000 and some change are at that floor. So because values, and I mean it's happening up here in the Panhandle, in West Texas, all along, it's not just the I-35 corridor, everybody's sitting that floor. So that's one reason that they're going to adjust the floor. Of course, the second reason is property tax relief. Looking at our history, on the MNO side, we're at 9429. 
Way back in 2005, we were at that max of $1.50. A lot of school districts were at $1.50. Then there was talk of it's a statewide tax because everyone's at it. So there were adjustments and it started going down. And then you'll see virtually everybody was at $1.04 for many years. Um, and then we had the TRE. So we increased to $1.17. We were able to stay there for three years. House Bill 3 came into effect and we started the compression. And now this 9429 is that MCR of 846, our eight golden pennies, and the five copper. On the INS side, you can see um, 48 cents is the highest we ever got, 50 cents is the max. When we did the 2014 bond, we were thinking we would go to the max of 50 cents. We didn't have to. And then you can see it dropped when we did the TRE. And we've been able to maintain 35 cents, even though we issued the 14 bonds in the 2018 bond program. So we have a little thing called the legislative session going on down the road. Um, it's full of lots of fun right now. Both the House and the Senate have set aside $15 billion for property tax relief. Um, there's a lot of opinions on how to do that. I just read an article, even the speaker and the lieutenant governor are fighting about this. There's talk of an increase in the homestead exemption to 70000 We don't know what that will look like um, until the session ends. I'm pretty sure we'll see additional compression of that MCR, so that 8046 will be lower. Um, we are all, all school people are pushing for an increase to the basic allotment because that helps fill the size of our glass and the size of our jar. So if we had the same 10,000 students, but now we get 6,500, obviously our glass is going to be bigger than that 6,100. The other part of that is we keep more tax collection, so we pay less than we capture. And then under current law, anytime there's an increase in this, it triggers a provision that says 30% of the gain that you get from this increasing has to go to teacher compensation increases. So this increase right here is three pronged. It gets the school district more money, it gets less recapture, and it gets more money for teachers. So that's why that's the easiest fix um, to address three issues right now. So, to summarize this, recapture is triggered when what? Let's test your knowledge. Don't look at the screen. <laughs> our tax collections exceed our entitlement, right? The state has those safeguards so that we can't get out of recapture on that tier one. That's, I just have not figured out a way to make that happen. Five billion is the estimate for this year. That is by far the largest we've seen ever, and that's a, if they would put that back in education, that would make a huge difference. Um, an increase to the basic allotment would help with recapture, plus a lot of other things, as well as additional compression of that MCR. So, Jennifer, do you have the exam to pass out? <laughs> it's really simple. Just think about the jar. How do we increase the size of the jar? Um, and again, if you have suggestions for what you would like to revisit or see new in April, I would love to hear that. Otherwise, I'm going to bring you something really boring and dry. Um, next Taxpayer Tuesday is at Rooster, same time, 9.30 to 11. You can RSVP there. Um, all right, so let me have them. Throw them at me. You said 2019 was the last time they did the adjustment. Uh, was that, so that was the basic allotment adjustment? Is that that's when they, in, they introduced the basic allotment, overhaul school finance, and said it's expensive. Do they have a regular schedule on when to revisit that, or is that just completely based on when legislation feels like it? There's no regular checks and balances. No, there, are, there is some push to have it pegged to inflation. So if inflation increases, it automatically increases. That really takes a lot of budget control out of their hands, and so I don't feel like they want to do that because they don't have the money to do that. Sure. And then our recapture, we default to the purchase of attendance credits. 
is that just the title of it or is that directly correlated to our daily attendance record? So our money is based on the daily attendance? Is it it's average? really just a name for it. Okay. What happens is we send the wire, the TEA, for that amount that we owe. They're not giving us anything. We're not increasing our ADA and formulas. It's really just a name for it. Okay. So our daily attendance, how is that related to the recapture because obviously attendance matters for, for what the number is. Do we still take it, here's your total attendance and this is what we send in? Or how, how is that for So that glass, that jar, is that 6160 times average daily attendance. Average, okay, that's the WADA. So or, no, no. That's, that's just ADA. Okay. That's not weighted. It's, okay. It becomes weighted when you add all of those weights for special ed, Got it. tech, all of that. Got it. So the more attendance, yes, that would help. So if all of our kids were here 100% of the time, our jar would get bigger and we would pay less recapture because that 6160 is on average daily attendance. Okay, thank you. I want to expand on that. I don't want to interrupt other questions, but legislatively, <coughs> legislature has a couple different options on how the schools calculate attendance. So we have the ADA, which is based on each campus has a different time of day which we take enrollment mm -hmm. and then legislatively they take one snapshot and that affects us for the whole year budget well no not really okay so we take an enrollment snapshot in october this is what right. the ada is an average for the whole year got it is there an option to go enrollment versus ada or ada there are some talk about funding us. I think we're one of six states that still fund on attendance, not enrollment. Mm -hmm. What I've gathered from the legislature is they think if they fund us on enrollment, we won't push to have kids in school. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So they, they hang it over our head because we have no interest in having kids in school, which is completely wrong. We know we want kids in school. So I don't think they'll make that switch. Okay. Okay. And real quickly, it's 11.05, 11.08, and I know some people have a hard stop and need to get out of here at 11, so Ms. Miller's in the back. Anyone who needs to leave now, we're gonna ask that you join her so that we can get y'all to your next meetings or whatever you have, and then we'll stay for about another 10 minutes and just answer questions for those who don't need to run off. But I know some of you need to leave and we're on an active campus and you just wanna escort you out. Thank y'all for being here. So, uh, I don't know if you could go back to several slides. How long has our INS rate been at 35 cents? How many years? Oh, that was terrible. Since 2015. Okay, so the last bond issue is 2018, and I'm assuming, I mean, the way that I think about it, it's like pay, it's your mortgage payment, it's principal and interest, that's what INS is basically. And and if there's no new bonds in that period of time, it, it, the, amount, the amount that needs to be, the payments that need to be made are steady Pretty from one year to the next. But, yeah, but we've right. had enormous property value increases at 35 cents in those years applied to enormous property value increases. That seems like there should be an enormous, you know, windfall of revenue coming in, but, but the INS payments are static remaining the same. So right. So just, if, we, if we were done building, we weren't going to do anything else, this would go down. But because we anticipate... But, but why, hasn't, new why hasn't it already... So done? this past year, it generated $5 million more than we needed to make the payment, and so we used it to pay off debt early. So there's a school of thought of keeping this steady rather than up and down, up and down each year. And so if there is an excess from this 35, it's used, it has to be used to pay off debt. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what would happen if the bond in November had passed, how that would have been? It's going to stay the same. So we were going to leave it, at, we anticipated leaving it at 35 cents in November because what this 35 is generating because of the value growth to so service the new bonds. Otherwise, we would drop this this year and then increase it next year. And so most school districts want to keep it steady versus the up and down because people never remember a decrease in the tax rate. They always remember an increase. Okay, so in my case, my mortgage, uh, I, I would not pay. I mean, I, I have a relatively low rate that I'm paying right now, and we all know interest rates have gone up. I would not pay down any of my my existing mortgage debt. I don't understand why would you pay down 
any lower interest debt when you're looking at future bond debt that's going to get a higher rate. Well, we're legally required to. I can't use that for anything else. No, no. I mean, why, why would you pay, pay it down more than you needed to? Is that what you well, said? You're, you're cutting the time off. Yeah, That's why. Because we have to buy more houses, Tony. You don't buy multiple houses. We buy multiple buildings. So we have to keep... But, I'm but, happy to visit but, with you afterwards. I want to get some other questions. Yeah. Um, the formula transition allotment, um, you, you alluded to something like um, maybe there's something in the works to be able to get to the, to the full capacity as far as the gifted and talented, the best growth. So, sure no, there's, so the state says, we're just going to throw out some yeah. numbers. For gifted and talented, we're going to allot $200 million across the state. All of the student accounts across the state are worth $300 million. Well, they only have $200 million, so every district doesn't get what they're entitled to. They get a reduced amount. Mm -hmm. okay. So formula transition grant, there's maybe 50 of us that still get it. There's not a lot of us. They only allotted $400 million, I believe. We were entitled to more of that, but they don't have the money. They could have used the extra recapture to fully fund that, but they said, no, we don't have enough, so we're going to reduce everybody's. So we, we don't find out how much the state has and how much they're going to reduce until this time of year. So last month they said, well, proration is more, so our entitlement is reduced a million dollars. So it makes it really hard to budget when you set a budget and then your revenues get reduced mm -hmm. and people fall under. And a lot of this has to do with the state legislator, the le legislative session that's in session. So program. this session, yeah. they could fully restore those programs and say we're going to fund them fully with no proration. The last session, they said we're going to fund them, but we're going to put a cap on how much as well. Would you go uh, another slide towards the end? Uh, yeah, the third bullet point, uh, state projected to collect $5 billion. If I remember correctly, you said at one of the prior sessions, they're not going to spend that entire $5 billion on schools. They're putting it in the general fund. Do you know what that number is? Which number? How much is not going to be spent on schools? Out of the $5 billion, is it... Uh, they're only going to spend four billion, and the other billion goes. So they, into they don't really say, "Oh, we're going to take this." And so it goes into their general revenue pot, and then they determine how to spend all those revenues. So if they fully restore the cuts they made to education in the last session, I don't know what that would cost, but they could use that five billion that increase. So right now they're sitting on a thirty-three billion dollar surplus. A lot of that is because of this. And what they're paying for education has gone down because school districts are picking up. More. Right, but I'm interested in that number when I talk to my friends about what's going on in the legislature to tell them state is collecting five billion, but it's only putting four billion back into education. It's using one billion, and I'll call it a slush fund. To kind of yeah, spend I don't that know money. If I've seen a breakout like that. I've seen a breakout of how this compares to all their other revenue sources, and it's way up there. And then they usually say, well, they're allocating a this big pot X amount to education, and then it's split out among all the different allotments. But to say, oh, this five billion, they're using 3.5 for education. I don't know that they break that out for us that way. Okay. But it's a true statement to say five billion is coming in tax revenue via property school tax and not a dollar of it is legislatively guaranteed to go back into education. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's very fair to say the state is benefiting from property values. And not line itemizing it on our tax dollars. So what we believe is going to the district is going fact, to the state. Is it is a fact to say it's 20% of every collected tax dollar that goes into the MNO budget Use the district. I don't remember the exact percentage on anybody. That dollar that's broken out. Yeah, I think it was 20.96 million dollars. Is that a uh, uh, 33 billion dollar surplus at the state level? Is that an accumulated surplus over a number of years, or is that every year's? That's this fighting projected. Now. Okay, it's and that's projected to continue that amount of surplus, 
time if everything kind of improves? I don't remember what Hager is projecting the surplus for next year. Maybe. So what they do is he look. So he's in January when they go to 30, 32 point X fuel in surplus. The biennium that was 21, 22, 22. And so when they do their budget, he'll predict the surplus. All right, thank you all for coming. Thank you. I'm going to start working on that exam. <laughs>